Okay. Uh, in a few seconds. Okay. So good morning uh, or good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, so uh, welcome to this quantitative history uh, webinar. Um, uh, I'm uh, Zhu Wu Chen. Uh, professor of Finance uh, at the University of Hong Kong. So today we are very happy to have uh, my friend and uh, uh, famous uh, professor uh, uh, Yu Hua Wang uh, from uh, the Harvard uh, Kennedy School. So he's going to uh, speak on the rise and fall of Imperial China. Uh, this is based on uh, his new book uh, that just uh, came out. Of course, this topic it's also a very, very uh, timely uh, topic, given uh, what, what is happening uh, in China. So uh, let me first uh, just quickly mention uh, Professor Wang's background. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, he's a professor of government uh, at uh, Harvard University. So his research focuses on uh, two uh, aspects of uh, state building. Uh, first, uh, you know, what uh, drives the process, uh, that what drives the emergence and the process of uh, state building uh, to, you know, develop uh, effective and durable uh, statehood. And secondly, after an effective state emerges, how can the state be uh, constrained? So his first book uh, is uh, tying, the, uh, uh, tying the autocrats' hands the Rise of the Rule of Law in China. And then the second book, uh, which is uh, uh, the same as the title for today's talk, uh, The Rise and Fall of Imperial China, The Social Origins of State Development. Uh, so uh, as I've mentioned, you know, his work is a very um, timely uh, topic. I'm uh, very sure many of us uh, would like to uh, learn more uh, from his work in order to understand uh, and also, also in order to figure out how, how we can understand uh, what is happening today uh, in China and in the uh, future. So as uh, uh, before, the basic format uh, for today's uh, webinar is that Professor Wong uh, will talk for uh, about uh, 50 minutes to one hour and then uh, followed by uh, a discussion, uh, a comment uh, by uh, Professor Richard Hu. Uh, so many of you uh, may have uh, seen him um, giving discussions uh, in our uh, quantitative history webinar series before. So Professor Hu uh, used to be uh, a professor of uh, international relations and politics at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, and then because of uh, various, uh, you know, crazy rigid uh, policy constraints uh, at the University of Hong Kong, Professor Hu decided uh, a couple of years ago to uh, move to a better university, that is uh, the University of Macau. So we are very happy to have him uh, at least uh, virtually back uh, via Zoom to join our event uh, here um, uh, organized by us at the University of Hong Kong. So he will uh, 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 share his uh, thoughts and uh, reactions uh, to uh, the talk and the book. And then uh, after uh, Professor Hu's uh, discussion, uh, we'll move on to the Q&A session. So again, like before, uh, if you have any comment or questions uh, while the talk uh, and the discussion are going on, uh, please uh, uh, post your questions and comments in the Q&A box. So during the Q&A session, I, I will read 
uh, uh, your questions uh, for um, uh, Professor Wang. Uh, okay, so without uh, further ado, let me turn it over to uh, Professor Wang. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Chen, for that very nice introduction and also the kind invitation. I also want to thank Professor Hu in advance for his comments. Uh, it's my great pleasure today to have a conversation with you about my new book, um, which is titled uh, the, fall, the Rise and Fall of Imperial China, uh, The Social Origins of State Development. Um, let me start with the stories of two individual emperors in Chinese history. The first one is a lesser known one. This is uh, the Jingzong of Tang Dynasty. Uh, Tang Jingzong became the emperor of the Tang Dynasty when he was 14 years old in the year of 824. Uh, he sat on the throne for merely three years. And in 827, uh, when he was 17 years old, you know, he was not um, even an adult yet. One day he went to the palace and then he was assassinated by the elites uh, right in the court. The second emperor is a well-known one. This is uh, the Qianlong Emperor of the Qing Dynasty. Qianlong Emperor also became the emperor uh, very, very young uh, in 1735, but he sat on the throne for over 60 years. Um, and then he, in 1796, he decided that he is tired of being the emperor. And so he abdicated and passed the throne to his son and then lived for another three years. So he was one of the longest reigning monarchs in world history. If you only know the histories or the stories of these two individual emperors, you might think that uh, Tang Jingzong here uh, must live in a violent era, that he must be in a time with a lot of chaos and also elite struggle. And also the emperor, uh, the empire he was governing must be very, very chaotic. And then you might think, for example, based on Qianlong's long reign, you might think that the, the dynasty that Qianlong was, ruin, uh, was ruling must be a very rich one, but also a very peaceful one. But if you know something about Chinese history, you know that uh, the, the fate of the dynasties they were ruling were exactly the opposite of the fate of these two individual emperors, right? Um, when we think about the Tang Dynasty, for example, where uh, the Tang Jingzong came from, we know that Tang, Emperor, uh, Tang Empire was actually the dominant economy in the world. According to the economist Madison's estimate, Tang China occupied one fourth of the global GDP. Um, to give you a sense of what that means, uh, the United States today occupies one sixteenth of the global GDP, and then we call the United States the global superpower. But Tang China occupied one fourth of the global GDP, so you can see how dominant the Tang economy was at the time. And then when we look at the other end of Eurasia, for example, what's happening in Europe at the time? This is you know, eighth century, ninth century. Europe was the developing world, right? This is the time after the fall of the Roman Empire, right before the formation of the Carolingian Empire. And then Europe was the developing world. This is the time when Europe was poor, violent, and also chaotic. And then um, also going back to the Tang Dynasty, when we think about uh, the resources the Tang government was able to control, uh, one really important resources um, that Tang government controlled was land. Uh, uh, during most of the Tang era, uh, the Tang government controlled the majority of land in China, right? This is a, a, a very, very special in all Chinese history. You know, this is no longer the case, for example, after the Tang dynasty. Uh, you probably also have heard of the Silk Roads. And then the Silk Roads also originated during the Tang dynasty in which the Tang merchants were able to use the Silk Roads to structure international trade, to connect, for example, China with Europe and also the Middle East. And lastly, uh, the Tang era was also the time when China had a huge in, influence on its neighbors, uh, particularly in Japan and Korea. For example, Buddhism, language, laws, and bureaucracy in these two, uh, two places were borrowed from China. In contrast, when we think about uh, Qianlong Emperor and also the Qing Dynasty that he was governing, this is already a declining power. Uh, Qing China occupied only one twentieth of the global GDP, right? Compared with one fourth, you know, in the Tang era, in the Qing era, uh, China occupied only one twentieth of the global GDP. 
And then when we look at the other end of Eurasia, for example, Europe at this time was already at the early stage of state building and also at the start of the Industrial Revolution, which made Europe much, much more richer than China. And then when we think about state capacity, for example, uh, one measure we often use to measure state capacity is how much taxation the government can collect from the total GDP. Uh, according to some estimates, the Qing government could collect only 1% of the whole economy throughout the 18th and 19th century. And then um, the Qing army could barely protect itself. We all know what happened to the eight banners, for example, during the Taiping Rebellion. And also starting in the 19th century, we all know that this is also the era of mass rebellions. We have the White Lotus Rebellion and then later on in the mid 19th century, the Taiping Rebellion. This is also the time of foreign invasions. You know, the Opium War started in the mid 19th century and China was almost colonized, right? So the puzzle, I guess, motivated me to write this book is why do we see, you know, why do we see the fate of the emperors so different from the fate of the dynasties they were governing, right? And then you might think that, you know, uh, I might have chosen two emperors or two dynasties to make my case, but um, uh, when I collect a large number of data, you know, based on all the emperors, this is still the case that is, the emperor's personal fate is the opposite of the dynasties that they were ruling. For example, this graph shows you the probability of being deposed among all the emperors in the last 2000 years, you know, from the, the Qin Shi Huangdi, the first emperor, to the last emperor in the Qing dynasty. And then the line here is the moving average of the probability of being deposed. And then the way I calculated this is, for example, I choose 100 years, and then I use the total number of emperors as the denominator, and then the uh, the number of emperors deposed by the elites as the enumerator, and then I calculate the probability, and then move one year, calculate the probability again. So it's the moving average of this probability. So what you can see in this graph is in the first half of the imperial China, right, from the Han Dynasty to the late Tang Dynasty, Chinese emperors were increasingly insecure. That is, their probability of being deposed peaked in the late Tang Dynasty. You know, uh, for example, in the late Tang period, almost half of the late Tang emperors, including Tang Jingzong, were deposed by elites. But this probability peaked in late Tang and then very quickly declined starting in the Song Dynasty. And then up until the Qing Dynasty, Chinese emperors became increasingly secure. That is, uh, they, they became less than likely being deposed by the elites up until, for example, in the late Qing period, almost none of the Qing emperors were deposed by the elites, right? So you see this dramatic change of the fate of the Chinese emperors. But on the other hand, when we look at the strengths of the Chinese state, it's actually the opposite trend. For example, I collected data on First of all, all the major physical policies across Chinese dynasties, again, you know, from the, the Qin dynasty to the Qing dynasty. And then this graph here um, shows you, again, the moving average of those policies. The way I do this is I collected all the major fiscal policies, you know, taxation, for example, and then I give them a coding. If the policy was designed to increase taxation, I would give it a coding of positive one. If the policy was designed to maintain the status quo, I gave it a coding of zero. If the policy was designed to decrease taxation, I would give it a coding of negative one. And then what you see here is the moving average of that coding, right? And then you can see what happened is in the first half of Imperial China, right? Uh, you can see most of the policies on average were designed to increase taxation. But this again peaked in the late 10th century, and then starting in the Song Dynasty, you see most of the policies, with some exceptions here in the early Qing era, but uh, most of the policies were designed to decrease taxation. And then this is uh, similarly, you can see a trend in terms of per capita taxation. This is you know the uh, the total taxation divided by the total population in the unit of dan, a dan of rice uh, is, is equivalent to the volume of four gallons. And then you can see again, in terms of per capita taxation, you can see also it increased in the first half of Imperial China, peaked in the early Song era, and then started to, to, to decline. There was this one spike in the early Ming era, but in general, you can see the trend has been declining after the Song dynasty. And then uh, in the Qing dynasty, the per capita taxation has been very, very low. So the 
overall puzzle that motivated me to write this book is I want to I want I want to know why short-lived rulers govern a strong state and then long-lived rulers control the weak state. Why do we see ruler duration and state capacity to be on different ends of the seesaw? You can think about the seesaw, you know, one up, one down, right? And then overall, I also want to shed light on the question of what led to the consolidation of an absolute monarchy and also the weakening of the Chinese imperial state, right? Because we see these two contradictory trends happening at the same time in imperial China. That is, on the one hand, we see the consolidation, the strengthening of the emperor's power, the emperor's gaining more and more, more, more power. But at the same time, the Chinese state became much more weakened. So why do we see these two trends happening at the same time? Before I tell you my answer, I want to very quickly go through some of the existing answers um, that offered by social scientists. Uh, the first very popular theory about um, imperial China is this idea posed by Karl Marx originally, but also popularized by Carl Wittfogel in the 1950s, who wrote about Oriental despotism. And then this is the idea that the Chinese state was formed because of the need to manage flood and also irrigation. And then the story goes, for example, the Yellow River always flooded. Therefore, to manage the flood, there need to be some coordination among the tribes along the river. So therefore, there need to be a strong state to manage the flood and also to manage the irrigation for agriculture. Uh, this theory has been very popular and, and then shaped a lot of Westerners' impression of China. But I think the problem of this theory is, is a very static theory. That is, uh, the theory really focuses on the origin, but really doesn't talk about changes, right? You know, as I show earlier in my graphs, I show there are a lot of changes in Chinese history. Uh, but this story about Oriental despotism is only about the origin. It, uh, the theory believes that once you uh, um, uh, have the origin, the nature of the state, the, the structure of the state won't change over time. And it's also similarly, another very popular argument about Chinese history is about Chinese culture. That is uh, the argument argues that um, in the uh, warring states period, for example, uh, a political culture uh, focused on Confucianism, for example, which you know, is about social hierarchy, is about obedience emerged 2000 years ago. And then once that culture emerged, it started to shape the nature of the Chinese state, right? It's also very popular among the Chinese people, I think. And the problem of this argument is, again, also it's very static. It, it means that once you have the culture 2000 years ago, it will start to determine the nature of the state for the next 2000 years without talking about all the changes we have seen in the data. One theory that is uh, starting to look at changes is a theory called dynastic cycle theory. This is very popular among the historians. For example, you know, William Skinner, John Fairbank, they all uh, at some point in their career made this argument that in Chinese history, we can look at Chinese history as a repetition of dynasties. And then in each dynasty, there's a cycle. That is at the beginning, you often have very charismatic, very energy, very energetic rulers. They are the founders, for example. Think about you know Zhu Yanzhang, right? And then you know very energetic rebel leaders. But then the problem is uh, in the middle of the dynasty, you start to have those very weak rulers because you know it's a you know system they, they have to pass the throne to the son. They cannot always find a very smart son. So you know in the middle of the dynasty, you can have very weak rulers, and then also uh, income inequality become increased throughout the dynasty. At the beginning of the dynasty, you know, the government controlled a lot of land, but then you know, uh, as time passes by, local landlords started to accumulate a lot of land, but also wealth. And then that will provoke peasant rebellion. And the peasant rebellion will overthrow the dynasty. Then you have a new dynasty. So this is a dynastic cycle, right? So uh, Chinese history, according to this theory, can be seen as the repetitions of those dynasties. So you have the cycles. Um, the problem of this theory, again, is according to the data that I show you, uh, a lot of times it's not really cycles, right? When we see, you know, for example, ruler duration, but also taxation, it's not about, it's not, you know, within dynasty cycles. It's actually, there's a linear trend, for example, that uh, across dynasties, we can see this linear decline of the probability of being deposed among the emperors from the Song dynasty to the Qing dynasty. It doesn't happen, for example, within dynasties. The last um, literature I want to mention is 
some of the recent work by uh, done by social scientists, for example, by political scientists, but also primarily by economic historians. Uh, their work focuses mostly on the last part of Chinese history. That is, they look at what happened in the Qing dynasty, and then they want to explain why the Qing government was so weak in terms of taxation, but also economic development, so-called the Great Divergence literature, right? They want to explain why Imperial China fell. But then um, the problem is that they don't look at, you know, what's happening in between. That is, they don't look at, for example, the changes from the Qing dynasty to the Qing dynasty. There were 2,000 years. So there are a lot of changes we need to look at. So my argument can be summarized as the following one sentence. I argue that uh, the Chinese rulers faced a trade-off that I call the sovereign's dilemma. That is a coherent elite that could take collective actions to strengthen the state was also capable of overthrowing the ruler. That is, when you think about the ruler's goals, as the ruler of a state, they often have two goals. One is they want to have as much power as possible, right, to themselves, that they want to control as much as resources as possible. They want to, you know, stay in power as long as possible. But at the same time, they also have a second goal. That is, they want to have a strong state. That is, they want to have a strong government that can collect taxation, can mobilize the population. Therefore, they can consume the taxation. They can use the stronger military to defend their countries, right? So these are the two goals. My argument is uh, they cannot achieve the two goals at the same time because of this trade-off. That is, if you want to have a strong state, you need to have a coherent elite. But once you have a coherent elite, the coherent elite will threaten the ruler. And then to make you to stay in power for, for a very short time, you cannot stay in power for very, very long. On the other hand, you might want to have an incoherent elite. You want, want, you want, want to co uh, fragment the elite. Therefore, you can stay in power as long as possible. You can weaken them. But the consequence of weakening the elites is they will have no longer the capability, but also they won't be able to coordinate to trust each other, to make policies, to strengthen the state. So these two goals, you know, uh, to stay in power as long as possible and also to have a strong state are two contradictory goals that the Chinese emperors cannot achieve at the simultaneous, right, at, at the same time. So this is the sovereign's dilemma. Let me elaborate on this argument a little bit more. Um, in the book, I argue that um, I can use two ideal types of elite social structure to characterize the type of elite social connections that determine, for example, how long the ruler can stay in power, first of all, but also secondly, how strong the state is. And then in the first ideal type is what I call a star network. So in the star network, you can see there are those right nodes. Uh, there are two right nodes in the center. You can think about them as central elites, you know, Think about them as politicians who work in the central government, right? You know, central committee members, let's say. And then it doesn't matter, it doesn't really matter how many there are. So I use two as an example. You can think about three, you can think about a hundred, it doesn't really matter. But the the, the most important thing about the star, star network is the ways in which those nodes are connected with each other. Uh, so in the star network, the central elites are connected through social ties. And then in the book, I focus on intermarriages. So for example, uh, this means that this central official is connected through marriage ties. For example, his daughter might be married to the son of this central elite. So therefore, they are connected through intermarriages. At the same time, you also have those nodes in the periphery. Uh, those nodes are social groups. And in the book, I, I, I really refer to local families local elite families. And then they are in different geographic locations, right? They, you know, some are, are in the north, some are in the south. And then also the star network means that the central elites are connected with the local social groups through social ties. So for example, this person's second daughter might be married with the son of this family in the north. And then this person's, for example, second son might be married to the daughter of this family in the south. So through those social ties, all the nodes are connected with each other, you know, not only in the center, you know, all the central elites are connected through social ties, but also through those intermarriages, the central elites are connected with local families located in all geographic locations, in all the corners of the empire. The second 
type of elite social structure is what I call a bow tie network. It looks like a bow tie, right? And then the way it works here is you also have two central elites, but the two central elites are not connected with each other. You know, in this case, this very different from the star network here, the two central guys are not connected through any social ties, right? Also at the same time, each of the central elites is connected with social groups in only one geographic location. So for example, this central politician is married or his you know, sons and daughters are only married with families in the West. And then this politician is married with families only in the East. So therefore their social families, their their um, uh, social ties are geographically concentrated in one location, not across the whole empire. So these are two ideal types, which means you know, when you look at the reality, is, it is very different from the ideal types. You know, the reality is often messier, but I think they can uh, 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 be very powerful using these two ideal types and then to generate some hypothesis about how elite social structure can help us understand the two dependent variables that I care about. First of all, ruler duration, right? How long the emperors can stay in power, but also secondly, how strong the state is, you know, state capacity. The way it works is that I argue the star network is bad news for ruler duration, but good news for state capacity is because when the central elites are connected with each other, they can coordinate, they can make credible commitment to each other. For example, when they want to have a coup to assassinate the emperor, they can coordinate with each other, they can take collective action, right? And then also they can mobilize all the families across the whole empire against the central state, right? So you know, they have the interest to, in doing so, they also have the capability of doing so to mobilize all the social groups against the ruler when they want to, right? And then, so this is bad news for the ruler, but this is great news for the state because once you have the central elites that are connected with each other, they can coordinate, they can make credible commitment when they make policies, for example, they trust each other, they can push for central reforms to strengthen the central state. Also because they have an interest in doing so, because once their family interests are across the whole country, right, it makes sense for them to say, let's pay taxation, let's pay taxes to the central government, and then let the central government protect all of us because we are everywhere, we are in the north, we're in the south, and then it's much easier, it's much cheaper, right, to pay taxes, to have the scale economies and then to rely on the central state to protect all of us, right? So for, for those um, family in this, star network, it will be really redundant, for example, for them to protect themselves, for example, right? Because they're everywhere, they're all connected. Why do we need to spend money to protect ourselves? Let's just you know, send the money to the central government. They can build a national defense system, for example, and also the national protection coverage to cover all of us, right? So this is great news for state capacity. In contrast, this bow tie network is the opposite. Uh, the, uh, the bow tie network is great news for the ruler and bad news for the state, because when the central elites are not connected, right, they cannot trust each other. They are not. They don't have you know this kinship relations. And then when they want to mobilize each other, for example, if I talk to you and then I try to say, let's tomorrow go to the palace to kill the emperor, you won't trust me because we don't have the social ties. Um, so this is great news for the ruler, right? But this is really bad news for the state because uh, for the same reason, because the central elites are not trusting each other, they cannot take collective action to strengthen the central government, but also because their family interests are all concentrated in one region, right? For example, for this guy, it doesn't really make sense for him to say, let's pay taxes to the central government. You know, for him, it makes more sense to say, you know, let's let's keep all the resources in the West, right? Let's, let, let, let's strengthen our own localities. Let's keep the resources in our own hometown to strengthen our families. Because if we pay taxes to the center, the ruler might spend the money on the East. That's something we don't want to do, right? So let's keep the money in our own families. Let's strengthen our own families. Let's have the autonomy from the central state. So this is bad news for state capacity. So the elites embedded in this type of bow tie network are not interested in state building. They won't support for any state building reforms. So it's a very simple theory, right? Uh, I use these two graphs, uh, star network and bow tie network, but I think they're very powerful in explaining what happened in China in the last 2000 years. So the, the whole book talk about how those 
networks can be applied to different time periods in Chinese history. And then so to make the story simple, uh, it's the idea that in the last 2000 years, uh, I characterized the first half of Chinese history from the Han Dynasty to the Sui Tang Dynasty as a period of a star network. So that you know the elite um, social structure can be best characterized as a star network. And then so we should expect to see high state capacity and also low ruler duration in this era, right? And then in the second part of Imperial China, I argue that the elite social structure can be best characterized as a bowtie network. Therefore, we should expect to see low state capacity and high ruler survival. That's exactly what we saw in the beginning of my presentation, you know, using those graphs, right? And then I remember Winston Churchill said that uh, history is just one damn thing after another, right? So that's usually what happens to history books. What I try to do here as a social scientist is to offer a theory, um, maybe not a perfect theory, but you know, that is some theoretical framework, some theoretical thinking, and then to impose a structure onto Chinese history where one damn thing after happened after another, right? So that is, there are a lot of historical details, but we need to have some theoretical framework to put them together to explain what happened and why those things happened, right? So that's the basic structure of the book. And then because today I only have, you know, 40 to 50 minutes, I won't have time to talk about the whole book. I spent you know, a lot of time talking about each dynasty in the book. So um, because of time limits, I will focus on this period, this transition period. So I'll start with the Tang Dynasty and I'll talk about what happened in this transition. So why do we see this transition from a star network to a bowtie network? And then talk a little bit about what happened in the Song Dynasty. A small note on how I discovered um, the data source that I use in the data. About um, 15 years ago, I took a trip to the city of Xi'an. Um, Xi'an is the capital city of Shanxi province. And it's also one of the oldest capital in China. And then in the downtown area in Xi'an, there's the temple. Uh, the temple kept a lot of tombstones. Um, uh, this temple is called Beilin. You know, some people who have been to Xi'an might have visited this, uh, this, this, this museum. It's actually a museum, it's also a temple. It's called Beilin. And then they have amazing collection of tombstones from some of them you know, from a thousand years ago, you know, from the Tang Dynasty, but a lot of them from the Song Dynasty, from the Qing Dynasty, from the Ming Dynasty, so on and so forth. And then I was just wandering in this um, wonderful museum, and then I stopped in some of the tombstones. And then I realized that, you know, as a social scientist, when I see this, you know, my eyes, you know, my eyes sparkle. That is, I realized this is data, right? This is, you know, something that is, can be very useful for social science research. So when I started reading the tombstone, on the front side of the tombstone, it says the name, you know, the honor, the position of the person, right? The deceased person, right? You know, for example, this is the tombstone of Fu Bi, who was an equivalent um, prime minister in the Northern Song Dynasty. So in the early 11th century. So in the on the front side of the tombstone, it says, you know, this is the position, but also his name. And then this is, you know, Fu Bi Mu Ming. And then I turn around uh, to look at the back side of the tombstone. That's where things become really interesting. That is on the back side of the tombstone, the carved a lengthy eulogy that a friend of Fu Bi wrote after Fu Bi died. So this is, you know, Fu Bi's family asked his friend to write a lengthy eulogy to document all the achievements that Fu Bi had done, right, in his whole life, and then carved on the tombstone. And then the tombstone, you know, survived, you know, more than a thousand years. You know, a lot of the, the, the language, a lot of the words, didn't survive, the paper didn't survive, but the tombstone survived over hundreds of years, right? And then when I started reading the Lancy eulogy, I realized that there are a lot of information, right? They started with the childhood, for example, the hometown childhood, and then the civil service examinations he took, you know, the rank, and then the all the positions he took, all the achievements, right? But then at the end of the tombstone, it started to say about the person's family members and then you know i won't read the whole thing here you can you can see what happens here so for example you know for fu bi they mentioned that uh you know he married the daughter of yan shu so we know now um 
the father-in-law, right? And then he, it also mentions they have three sons, you know, Fu Shaoting and also his position, Fu Shaojing and Fu Shaolong. And then they also mentioned they have four daughters. The first one married Feng Jing and then Feng Jing's position it goes on and on. Right? So it talks about all the four daughters and also their sons-in-law. And then talk about, you know, they also have three grandsons and three granddaughters. So this, you know, in classical Chinese, this is the beauty of classic Chinese. So you can see here in this uh, very few sentences, right? It has very rich information about every family member in Fubi's nuclear family. And then, which means that if I can collect the data from the tombstones, I can gradually, very slowly construct the kinship network of all those politicians in Chinese history, right? So that thought didn't come to me in 15 years ago in Xi'an, you know, during my trip, because I was working on my first book on China's legal institutions. But about eight years ago, when I started working on this book, this impression, this, this image of the tombstone suddenly emerged. And it occurred, it occurred, occurred to me that if I can spend some time uh, to collect all the data, I, I might be able to construct a data set of the kinship network of major politicians in Chinese history, dynasty by dynasty, right? Um, you know, uh, that idea came to me very quickly, but the process took me a very long time. I took about, you know, two or three years, I remember, relying on the help of a lot of people, my research assistants, to construct this database. The way I do this is I find um, the names of all the major officials in Chinese history by major official, I mean the people who held vice ministerial level position or above, you know, basically the, you know, uh, using today's political language, this is basically the, the central committee members, right? And then I look at whether they have a tomb, tomb epitaph uh, documented somewhere, right? And then I can find the information of his wife, his son, and also his daughter, and also the, the, the daughter-in-law and son-in-law. And then the sons-in-laws are all, also always uh, politicians, you know, bureaucrats. And then I can also, uh, in most times, I can find their tomb epitaph as well. So I can construct very gradually, you know, using this snowball technique to construct the whole kinship network of all the major politicians in Chinese history, right? Um, so for the periods I'm going to talk about today, which are Tang and Song, I was able to use the official histories, you know, the Tang Shi and Song Shi, to identify over 4,000 major officials. So those are the people who held vice ministerial level positions or above, right? So there were 4,000 people. And then using whom epitaph, but also gazetteers, you know, genealogies, but also uh, Harvard has a database called the, the China Historical, uh, sorry, uh, China Biographic Database, CBDB, uh, I was able to collect over 40,000 individuals in those major officials kinship network. You know, those are the people that, you know, for example, the, the family married into, right? their, their sons-in-law, their married, uh, their, their, their daughters-in-law, so on and so forth. Uh, one problem you have already probably noticed is for historical data, there's large missingness. <laughs> that is, you know, uh, I'm quite confident that the 4,000 people are the major officials because Chinese history, you know, the uh, the official histories did a really good job documenting names. But the problem happens here. That is, I am not confident that I can collect all the people in the kinship network. And you can imagine, for example, more famous people are more likely to have a, a, a tomb epitaph, and the more famous people, more, more powerful people are more likely to have some documentation about their families, right? So uh, you can imagine there's a huge missingness in the database that I constructed. So for um, the descriptive statistic that I show you later in the presentation, please understand them as indicative rather than representative. So they're not a representative sample of all the families. They're probably only the, the, the more famous ones, the more um, important ones. And then for all the regressions I did in the book, I use statistical technique, for example, multiple imputation or you know, randomizing the number and also controlling for the number of kin when rare regressions. So let me show you what happens uh, using my data. In the Tang Dynasty, uh, there's almost a consensus among the historians that the Tang Dynasty and also the Sui Dynasty the dynasty before the Tang Dynasty were ruled by an aristocratic class. That is, there were about 200 aristocratic noble families who ruled China in the 
medieval period. This is you know from the late Han period to the Tang period. Um, and then there are two things that made those aristocratic families very, very interesting. One is they all congregated, they all lived in the capital areas. So in the Tang Dynasty, there were two capitals, Luoyang, um, which Empress, uh, Empress Wu, Wu Zetian lived, and then also uh, Chang'an, which you know, all the other emperors uh, uh, chose. So there were two capital areas, and then all the male members of the 200 aristocratic families, uh, all, almost all of them lived in the two capitals because they all had government positions. So, you know, from Sui to the Tang era, basically two, to 200 families monopolized all the bureaucratic positions in the central government. So that is generations over generations. Um, they can send their sons and grandsons to work in the central government and then to control all the power in the center. So, you know, and then they want to live very close to the capitals. So they, they all have their male members living in the two capitals, Chang'an and Luoyang. And second characteristic that makes them interesting is because of their need to monopolize power, uh, there's also this need to build coalitions through intermarriages. That is, in the Tang era, among the 200 families, there is an exclusive intermarriage network among 200 families. That is, they marry with each other and only with each other. That is, they don't marry people outside the aristocratic families, right, among the 200 families. And then this is what I found in the data as well. So on, in the graph on the left, you can see this is the marriage network of the aristocratic families uh, based on the data that they collected. So each node here is an aristocratic family. And then you can see everybody is connected with everybody else, right, uh, through um, intermarriages. I don't know what happened to these two families. They don't hang out with other people, but most of the families, right, are embedded in this very close-knit intermarriage network. At the same time, you can also see that um, uh, those larger nodes here are the aristocratic families. They all congregated in the capital areas, you know, Chang'an and Luoyang, right? They're all concentrated here. But at the same time, through their intermarriages, they're also connecting with families that are located in different places in the whole um, empire, right? In the north, in the south, in the east, and um, in the West, because when those aristocratic families intermarry, their you know they their hometowns are in different places. For example, Boling, Boling Cui, or Taiyuan Wang, right? So they they all live in different prefectures in the Tang Dynasty. And then through those intermarriages, the central elites who live in the capital are able to connect with those families in different corners of the Tang Dynasty. So you can see, you know, in this graph, this is the uh, the geographic location of the whole kinship network. It looks a lot like the star network, right? Remember what's uh, happened in the star network is they have a very close connection within the center among the central elites, but at the same time, they're also able to connect local families that are located in different areas in the whole empire. So you can see this, this whole Tang kinship network looks a lot like the star network that they talk about. So what happened to the star network? What happened is a very sad story. That is, um, uh, uh, in the last 2000 years in Chinese history, the Northern Hemisphere, you know, um, not only China, but also in Europe, for example, the temperature fluctuated up and down. And then there were some warmer years, for example, those um, warmer uh, dots here, and then those blue dots here uh, indicate the colder years. And then you can see, you know, I won't go into details. You can read a lot of papers on this. You know, for example, this is called the um, the Little Ice Age. This is the, you know, uh, for, for about 300 years, they were very, very cold. And this is the, the warm years. This is called the, the, the medieval warm period. But what I want to focus on is what happened here in the late ninth century. You can see in the late ninth century, China experienced some of these coldest years you can see here, right? And then, and then what happens is in during the cold years, peasant rebellions were more likely to happen. And you can see this is the number of peasant rebellions that are collected from the official history. So you can see uh, the spike in different periods. For example, this is the Taiping Rebellion, right? But what I want to focus today is this spike. This is uh, what happened in the late ninth century when China was particularly cold. And then what happened in the late ninth century is the Huang Chao Rebellion. This is a very famous 
mass rebellion led by Huang Chao, who was a salt merchant. You know, he was um, trading salt, but salt was monopolized by the government at the time, and he was not very happy with the taxation that he had to pay, the fees he had to pay to the Tang government. So he led a rebellion. And then the rebellion was so extraordinary because the rebellion happened somewhere here, but then they quickly went to the capitals, Chang'an and Luoyang, in 881. And then they occupied the two capitals for two years from 881 to 883. And during the two years of occupation, they nearly physically completely destroyed the Tang aristocratic families. That is, there were 200 families you know, with their male members right, who were working in the central government at the time. But also, unfortunately, they all lived in the capitals. And then when the rebels came in, the rebels killed all of them almost all of them, right? There were some people who survived because they were working in the provinces and they were sent down to the provinces. But most of the aristocratic families, the male members were killed during the Huang Chao rebellion. And then that changed not only the Tang dynasty, but also the whole Chinese history. What happened afterwards was starting in the 10th century, China had a power vacuum that is, before the 10th century, you know, you know, throughout in the late in the late Han period, throughout the Tang Dynasty, China had this sustainable source of bureaucratic talents. That is, the emperors at the time don't need to choose; they just, you know, select the sons and grandsons from the 200 families. But starting in the Song Dynasty, there was no longer this source of bureaucratic talents that the emperors could draw from, and then therefore, um, to have this new source. The Chinese emperor, starting in the Song Dynasty, started to rely on the civil service examination system, the Keju system, right? So we all know that the Keju system started in the Tang Dynasty, but um, in the Tang Dynasty, Keju was a very unimportant way of selecting bureaucratic talents. I show some data in my book that um, most of the central officials in the Tang Dynasty were from the aristocratic families. And then only a few number of them were selected through the civil service examination system. And also, uh, uh, even though those people were selected through the Kirti system, they were still from the aristocratic families. So it's not really about their, their, you know, their grades in the exam that made them become officials. It's actually their pedigree, their family background that made them very different. It's really in the Song dynasty that China started to systematically rely on the Kirti to select bureaucrats. And then one of the consequences of Keju, there are a lot of studies on, on, on how Keju changed China, but I think one thing I, I, I mentioned, which is quite different from previous um, studies, is I show that the Keju had a really huge impact on the social structure of the Chinese elites. And this is, you know, um, what Robert Hartwell and uh, um, uh, Himes called the localist turn of Chinese elites. The way it works is the following, that is, once Keju became really important, um, in the Song times, the emperor required that every person who want to take the Keju to get a recommendation, you know, some approval from some local notables. And then you know, the people who have taken the Keju before, they have to vet and guarantee that, you know, this young, young kid, you know, is of high quality, of high reputation, right? And then the need for this uh, uh, vet from this a recommendation from this local notable incentivizes all the local land-owning elites to build marriage coalitions with other elites. Say, for example, you know, someone succeeded in the Keju before, and then that will attract all the families to build marriage alliances with this person, right? And then, um, because they all want to get a recommendation from this notable. And then that means that a lot of land Landowning elites start to build those local networks, you know, with the local elites to get a recommendation to help their son, grandson to succeed in the civil civil service examination system. But also at the same time, because education becomes so important in the Song era, it also means that to fund the education, to pay for the tutor, for example, to to pay for private academy to buy books, um, land holding became also very very important. That is all the all the families starting in the Song era started to invest in land holding, to control land, to become landowners in the hope that they can get the returns, the income generated from the land to invest in their son and grandson's education. This is very similar to contemporary China where you buy, you know, for example, a, a, a very good house in a school district 
uh, in the hope that your, your, your children can go to the school in the same school district, right? So there's, there's a very similar dynamic in Song China. That is, you want to become landowner and then you want to use the income generated from land to fund your son, grandson's um, education, right? And then that also means that the land will tie the Chinese elites to a locality because they need to take care of the land. They become locally entrenched, right? They don't tr travel far. They don't want to build marriage alliances with families far away from them because it's not really useful, right? They, what they want to do starting in the Song era is to build local connection to know the people in their own county, for example, and then to uh, consolidate their power base in this county to take care of their properties in this land to, um, with the hope to help their son succeed in the Keju system. So that's what happened after the Song. That is, with the Keju system, it really uh, localized the social relations of the Chinese elites. And that's also what I saw in the data. That is, uh, uh, based on the data collected from the Song dynasty, we can also see that the social structure of the Chinese elites, again, you know, these are the, the major officials in the Song dynasty, you know, those people who held vice ministerial level positions or above, right? You can see the social structure dramatically change from the Tang era. So what happens here is on the left, you can see this is the marriage network of the central officials in the Northern Song Dynasty. And then you can see it's no longer well-connected compared with the Tang network, right? In the Tang network, everybody was connected with everybody else. But in the Song network, you can see a lot of families that are not connected with other families. You can see a lot of isolates in this network graph, right? At the same time, you can also see the geographic locations of those families. They no longer congregated in the capital areas, right? Then, you know, Kaifeng was the capital at the time. It's here. A lot of families were still in Kaifeng, but you can still see a lot of families start to be chosen from different areas in the Song Dynasty. And then also, uh, you might not see it very clearly here. Uh, I'll show you later. You start to realize that all the elite families start to marry locally. That is, they don't marry people from far away. They start to marry their local neighbors. They start to build their local marriage alliances in the same county. And this is more clear. That is, I put the Tang network with the Song network in different uh, time period. This is our different emperors, so I collect data based on the emperors. And then you can see uh, uh, in terms of network density, the Tang network is just much higher than any of the networks in the Song dynasty, right? So the, the network density is, 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 is more than twice of the network density in any of the Song periods. Another dimension of the network is how localized they are. You know, as I said, uh, one change in the Song Dynasty is they became more localized. So to measure this more systematically, I use a, an index used by um, um, economic geographers um, to measure how localized the network is. And then the, the basic idea of this index is the, 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 uh, the, clo the closer you are to your marriage alliance, for example, you know, where your sons and your, your daughters are married to, uh, the closer those relationships are, the bigger the index is. So this is uh, uh, an index of how localized their marriage networks are. And then this uh, two graphs show you two examples that I use in one of the chapters on the Wang Anshi reform on the Song, you know, during the Song Dynasty. And then in the graph here on the left, this is the marriage network of, of uh, Wang Anshi, right, the, the leader of the reform. And, you can see that his kinship network is dispersed in the whole empire. Right? In, 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 during the Northern Song Dynasty, you know, uh, Wang Anshi's hometown is here in Jiangxi province, but his uh, daughters and sons and also his, uh, you know, uh, uh, marriage alliances, right, uh, are located in different places in the whole country. This, in contrast, is the kinship network of Lu Gongzhu, who is the leader of the opposition, right, you know, he opposed the the Wang Anshi reform. And you can see that his kinship network is much, much more geographically concentrated. That is, most of his um, marriage alliances, partners, are from nearby provinces, right? And then you can see the, the using the index, uh, this index for Lu Gongzhu is much higher than the measure for Wang Anshi, right? So, so, so this is a much more concentrated um, kinship network. And then using this measure, I, I can then calculate the average 
localization score of the kinship network among all the major officials from the Tang era to the Song era. That this is, you know, this is the mean, this is the mean score of how localized the kinship network was among all the major officials from early Tang to late Song. You know, and then this graph shows the changes in about you know um, 500 years. You can see in the Tang era they have a very low localization score, which means the kinship networks tend to be spread out, right? They are from different places. But then this measure, the, the average localization score almost doubled in the Song era, which means during the Song times, the major officials tend to have more localized kinship networks. So what happens after this changes, right? Uh, when the structure of the elite social network changed, there are two consequences. On the one hand, when the central elites, those um, people who work in the central government, when their social networks became fragmented, when they no, are no longer connected with each other, right? This means that the emperors starting in the Song times onward was able to take advantage of the divisions among the elites to strengthen their monarchical power and then to uh, um, lengthen their durations. That is, you know, the emperors starting in the Song Dynasty, especially in the Ming Dynasty, for example, were able to divide and conquer the elites because the elites are not connected with each other, right? There's, they're so incoherent that gave the opportunity for the emperors to divide and conquer. And therefore we see a stronger emperor and also a, a longer living emperor, right? But at the same time, when the elites became localized, that is they tend to marry their local neighbors rather than people from far away, they have a weaker incentive to strengthen the central state. That is, starting from the Song era, the Chinese elites who work in the central government, but they all think about their own family. They all think about their own localities. They are no longer interested in making policies to strengthen the central government because for them, their interest lies at the local level, right? They want to keep the resources at the local level. They want to keep their autonomy from the central state. They don't want to strengthen the central state. So their, 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 their state building incentives became weakened. And then that trend continued toward the later half of Chinese history. I won't have time to talk about the Ming Dynasty and Qing Dynasty, but I think I just want to show this one map of what happened in the late Qing era. This is the, um, the data I collected based on the genealogies, Jiapu, of Chinese families. And then you can see that uh, in the late Qing era, this is the uh, early 19th century, uh, China was basically divided by those local elite families, right? You have, you know, the Wang family here, you have the Liu family there. And then uh, all the families control natural resources. they also started to be responsible for local governance and also local defense. And then especially during the Taiping Rebellion, we all know what happened is uh, the local families started to have local private militias. They, they started to have their private armies that really threatened the monopoly over violence of the central state, right? And then I spend a lot of time in the book, but I won't have time to talk about the day, but that's, I think, the key reason to the fall of the Imperial China. So to uh, summarize my argument, I think my argument can be summarized uh, in the following uh, sense. That is, I argue that uh, what I call elite social terrain, that is the structure of elite social relations uh, made the Chinese state, that the Chinese state really conditioned on how the elite social relations were structured. But at the same time, uh, the ruler, they can exploit the exogenous shocks, for example, you know, climate change and you know, the Huang Chao Rebellion in the late, late 9th century to reshape the elite social terrain, right? So these two things go together. That is, they co-evolve together, you know, the social structure of the elites and also the state, they determine each other. But then the key thing here is when there's a chance, when there's an opportunity that emerges, the ruler can use that opportunity to reshape the social terrain of the elites to lengthen their own rule and also to make themselves more powerful, but then at the expense of the capacity of the Chinese state, right? And then um, the, the takeaway I think is, um, there is this uh, a trade off that the Chinese emperors face, that is they want to strengthen their own power, but also want to strengthen the state, but they cannot do both because once you have one type of elite structure, you can either strengthen the state or strengthen yourself, but you cannot do both, right? And then uh, what happened in the latter half of Chinese history is the emperors were so obsessed 
with their own power. They care so much about staying in power for a very, very long time. But then the consequence is they have to fragment the elites, make the elites weaker. But then the consequence is the Chinese state will become weakened and then fall. So I'll stop here and then I look forward to Professor Hu's comments and also your uh, questions and comments. Thanks. Wow, this is great. Um, a lot of data collection and a uh, good um, uh, analytical framework, uh, you know, applied to uh, uh, the landscape or, or the geography of social relations among the elites during different uh, times uh, in Chinese history. But let, let me now invite uh, Professor Richard Hu to, uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, discuss, uh, you know, uh, the uh, talk and uh, and so on. Okay, so Richard. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Zhu. Uh, it's good to uh, reconnect with Hong Kong U. I've been away for more than three years. It's always feel good to come back to Hong Kong U big family. Especially I enjoy uh, Zhu Wu's uh, quantitative history uh, webinar. Um, I also want to congratulate, congratulate um, uh, Professor Wang, uh, Wang Yuhua, on his um, excellent book, uh, and also today give a um, um, very illuminating uh, presentation about his work, his project on the, um, on, on the Chinese um, uh, history, focused on state building and then ruler's duration. Um, I find it is very uh, fascinating to listen through this uh, presentation. Uh, he gave an excellent summary of the book and uh, the ideas. I think this is um, this is what we call the uh, grand uh, uh, grand uh, discourse, Hong Da Xu Shi. So it's a big history. <laughs> And uh, secondly, um, he has a lot of, lot of data. So it's a big data uh, uh, angle to explain the long history uh, that also should be commended. And uh, I find um, very few people, especially old generation, uh, they, uh, could, uh, they could use this way to explain Chinese history. So that bring us uh, some, um, uh, some new perspective, shed new light on um, study of Chinese history. Uh, and, um, and also uh, this is, uh, uh, should be commended, uh, he uh, bring uh, some new perspective for the for Chinese politics studies, you know, the, the state building and then the, and then the rulers, you know, uh, how uh, they are, what's the relationship here? You know, so that's, uh, I find very uh, fascinating to look, to look, uh, to, to listen through this uh, presentation. Now, um, uh, the, the key message uh, from his talk, from his book, I think is about um, the, what he called, uh, uh, Professor Wang called the uh, Zorban Dilemma, uh, which is, uh, uh, the, the short-lived emperor uh, often ruled a long uh, uh, or strong state, you know, what, we, what he calls strong state, while the long-lived uh, emperor sometimes uh, governed a weaker one, a weaker state. So there's a mismatch. Uh, long-lived uh, emperor uh, ruled a weak state, how the, the weak state could last longer as, 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 as well as the, uh, the, the emperor's survival longer period. And then uh, how this, uh, <clears throat> the weak ruler or short-lived ruler uh, could um, rule the, you know, uh, could, uh, could, uh, could, uh, could, rule, could rule a strong state, you know, here, I think uh, the, uh, the, <clears throat> the key point, uh, the, the key takeaway from his talk is about, uh, we need to think behind this. It is the social network, what he called the uh, uh, social uh, elite terrain to explain this. You know, I, I, we, we can see he, he showed a lot of data, uh, the elite marriage uh, network 
the kinship network and then how we bring this to the explanation of Chinese history. So, um, so he, his argument is uh, uh, the we need to focus on the the uh, the elite network. The social network is important because a coherent elite could um, uh, collectively strengthen uh, the state, but they also but they can also collectively overthrow the ruler. You know, that's, I, I found this very interesting. We just eyewitness um, uh, this kind of things uh, in UK in the uh, last week, you know, a collective elite overthrow their boss. Uh, so there's a new prime minister came to office because of the, uh, the um, collective elite within the conservative party can bring a new, uh, can, can, can shuffle their, their boss, can, can make um, Liz Truss uh, step down and then bring a new prime minister to the dining street. So this is a very uh, interesting uh, argument. I find this very, very interesting. Uh, now, very few people <clears throat> make this kind of, um, uh, you know, grand argument uh, over long history. You know, this is a, this is a, a big discourse, uh, but I, I'm, I'm not a, quantitative person, you know, and also I'm, um, uh, my, my main interest in is international relations studies. So my comments may have some bias. So from my bias, I want to <laughs> give some, I want to ask some questions to Professor Wang. Um, maybe this is reflect my bias. <clears throat> the first question uh, is um, a coherent elite. Uh, could collectively strengthen the state. They could also collectively overthrow the ruler. It is true. Uh, the, the evidence you show uh, in the talk and the book uh, is a, a makes sense, make a lot of sense. But the question is, uh, in the Chinese history, over 2000 long uh, history, you explained how coherent the, uh, the elite, the elite group, the, especially we're talking about not just a social or kinship network. We talk about, we talk about the key elite, we, we call it political elite. These people are very important. These people probably stay in the, in the capital or, or key cities, or they are occupied the key positions uh, for, the, uh, for the state. Uh, so how coherent these uh, elite could be over time, are these coherency changes in what pattern? And then the other key variable is how the ruler deal with the elite. You know, the ruler are getting smart. Um, you know, even you read the Chinese history, you know, they think about how to deal with their ministers, how to deal with their uh, other ministers, you know. Uh, so they have a lot of, uh, skills, you know, we call the way of governing. Uh, Wang Shaoguang called it zheng dao, to, to deal with the uh, elite. You know, start from Qin Shi Huang, start, there's a, a Fen Shu Keng Lu, you know, kill a lot of uh, intellectuals. Intellectual may not be elite, uh, not maybe the political elite, but they are elite. They, they're spreading ideas in a society. So <clears throat> the rulers, a uh, way to deal with elite <clears throat> is very important. And then how they could use, as you said, conquer and uh, divide or divide and rule. Uh, this this skills <clears throat> is very important for the ruler. So the ruler, uh, they stayed uh, longer, probably more skillful. Uh, so so this is uh, <clears throat> one thing we need to, <clears throat> when we need to, uh, to think about uh, it interactive uh, pattern. It's not uh, something static. It's, it's not something you show the network. It will be uh, uh, independent variable to cause the change. Uh, you need to put into, uh, you know, interactive uh, way to look at this, uh, this uh, collect, uh, coherent or collective uh, elite group and uh, their rules. And then I, I, I think your, 
uh, your your graph is fascinating. The star network, the bow tie network, you know, it uh, graphically show us the network, the structure, uh, how they organize. And uh, but uh, I would push you to look at uh, in a more dynamic way how they influence politics, you know, from local level at the or the state level. So this is a one comment, uh, first comment I want to make. The second comment, uh, I agree with you, um, uh, the uh, ruler survival, and then the, the, uh, the, the short duration uh, have something to do with the state uh, capacity or the state strength, uh, or, or the vice versa, the, the way you put, there's a, I, I remember there's a, there's a graph, there's an equation you show us. Uh, you know, that divided 2000 years of Chinese politics, you know, into two periods. Uh, I, I think this is a show something very clearly, you know, big message for us to read. Uh, but the question is, my question is here, um, I'm an IR person, study international relations. In study IR questions, we tend to put uh, our, uh, opt, uh, our object, our uh, issues into different level of analysis. The individual land analysis and then the state level analysis, the system level analysis, you know, there's a, quite a few level of analysis. And then we give different weight to this different level of analysis when we tackle issues, different issues. Uh, here, uh, sometimes I think, uh, uh, the different levels they interact, they interact uh, each other. It, it is true, but it's very difficult to find uh, the connection here. You know, as an IR scholar, I, I find that sometimes it's very difficult to deal with these issues. And uh, but the the issue is the short duration of some rulers. It is because their individual reasons, or because the reasons at state level. So this is sometimes uh, we need to think about these issues. And uh, I find sometimes uh, you probably, you know, um, put them in the same jargon, you know, the uh, sometimes the, the short duration of ruler because a lot of reasons at individual level, their health reason, they've been assassinated. There's a internal uh, power struggle within the imperial court, or there's um, uh, outside uh, war, whatever reasons, you know. So sometimes it's an individual level, we tend to sort out reasons. And then some, something is really because the state level uh, reasons make that ruler, you know, uh, the rule becoming shorter, you know, that, that's possible. Uh, but we, um, but my point is that we need to sort out the different reasons, the short duration, short duration of a ruler, and then the uh, the state uh, strengths. There's also a lot of in factors impact that state strengths, and that's that's probably my third comment. You know, next comment, the state level reasons. The state uh, capacity, the state strength uh, could, could also cause by different reasons. Maybe not just because the ruler, the individual reasons, the how smart the ruler, the capacity of the ruling uh, ruler, the skills. Maybe there's a lot of other reasons. So at the state level, uh, the low state street strengths or strong state, <clears throat> what's the reason behind? Uh, you know, you, you talk about, uh, you use the, uh, the network and also put network in the spatial uh, uh, dimension to look at the distribution. I think that's very good to look at, uh, uh, you know, what we call in today's politics, we call the central local relationship. Uh, so that's a that's a very key variables, and then you 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 argue that uh, the later the the state probably uh, stronger, and then 
the uh, elites becoming more localized. They pay more attention to the local uh, wealth, uh, creating wealth, their power in the local. So the, the, so the state level becoming, uh, you know, the state becoming weak. Uh, but here you divided the local state and then the, the central state. Uh, um, so are we talking about the same state uh, strength or should put in the different levels? Uh, should the central local relations put, should, should be considered? And um, I think this is a, this is a, there's a lot of things in this uh, big basket uh, need to be ex further explained. And um, uh, so, so that's my third comment, you know, for the time I'll move on. Now, the next comment I want to make is about uh, uh, the state capacity, a lot of things to, to, to come into play. Uh, there's economic reason, external reason, and then domestic policy. I, I think it's a key reason is, uh, is the system, is the, what do we call the, the, the governing system. You talk about the, the system change, but you, you only talk about and then other things. But over time, if we look at Chinese history, uh, the way of governing has changed and then they becoming institutionalized. And then in the early history, the Chinese uh, governing system actually is pretty advanced. Uh, later on, comparatively, they, they decayed, but this political decay. Uh, but uh, but uh, <clears throat> but uh, but that doesn't exclude some emperor. They know how to govern. Uh, so that's why today, when we talk about ruling a state, when we talk about the state uh, strength, we often uh, talk about uh, state uh, governing capacity and a state governing system. Uh, put into today's language, uh, so they, now today's politics, they focus on this. So, so in, the, in the old days, the rulers also, you know, you know, understand this, you know, especially they open up, they have, a, 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 they uh, have a contact with the outside they're getting these ideas, how to rule the state in a modern way. So the, I think, so I think this, the, the key thing is the, the system, the institutional factor was not uh, shown in your uh, big data. And then how we measure the institutional uh, capacity and then the changes of this institutional capacity uh, if you can uh, put in more effort, uh, that will be very, uh, very good, you know, help to uh, convince more people because the rules changes, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, civic uh, uh, civil servant system, <clears throat> and then uh, the, the modern system, uh, it helped to, to bring up, to show up the uh, state capacity. So measure the state capacity, uh, not just network. Network is very important, <clears throat> social network, and uh, also the 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 governing uh, institution is very important. And, and this this is a, a factor. I hope in your future study you can uh, you can talk about. This is not material capacity. This is a non-material capacity. <clears throat> what do we call the soft power? You know, soft power uh, is very important. Uh, talking to measure this, uh, you know, the state uh, capacity or strength. Uh, now, for the time being, I, I, let me move to the last uh, uh, comment, I, I, the, uh, the, the last thought I have, uh, which is uh, <clears throat> you show us a lot of data. Uh, my question is, um, um, <clears throat> The big data, we, everybody talk about big data now, <laughs> but how big is big enough to explain things? Uh, are, are these data you show us is enough to, to tell 
there's a correlation, there's a causal relation between the ruler duration and the state strength. So, so here I, I'm, kind, I'm kind of putting, pushing the envelope to, to ask scholars, <clears throat> our colleague, to, uh, to give us more data. And then especially to tell us clearly um, the limit of the big data can tell us, you know, uh, how much uh, data is enough. And uh, in this case, you know, how, do we have the enough data to showcase this, uh, this study that the, the, the relation between the ruler duration and then the state strength? Uh, so then this is a probably not a legitimate question. It's unfair for you, you know, we know there's a limit for our capacity to collecting the data. And, uh, but, uh, but I'm pushing you and uh, for the future, I look forward to more data, uh, more explanatory uh, you know, powers in your study to show, uh, to show us. And then I look forward to your new book in a future study. Thank you. Yeah, thank, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Hu. Uh, so maybe uh, Professor Wang, would you like to, uh, address uh, a few of uh, uh, Rich's points very quickly. Uh, we are getting very close to the uh, ending time and I would like to leave some time for uh, the Q&A uh, part. Sure, I just very quickly, maybe in one minute because I know uh, there are a lot of questions in the Q&A. I want to thank Professor Hu for all the uh, thoughtful questions and also comments. I, I just, uh, I think um, a lot of the, um, um, uh, the questions I think I, I, I thought about, and then I think uh, the problem is I cannot say them in one hour. So I think a lot of them, I, you know, for example, for institutional details, you know, I talk about all the institutional changes in Chinese history in the book, and then I cannot really go over all of them in the talk. So I, I think what I do in the talk instead is try to focus on what happened under the surface, what I want to call, because we know what happened, you know, at the institutional level. Right? We know, for example, what happened to, to Zaixiang, right, to Chengxiang. In the Ming Dynasty, uh, those are the, the institutional details. But I think we, you know, I try to focus on what happened under the surface. That is, you know, why, what, what caused those institutional changes, right? And then over time, so I think that's why I focus on the social relations, the social networks, because we don't see them, right? We, you know, when we read history, we don't really see them talk about in history. So I think, you know, that's why scholars' work is so important. We want to uh, surface something that we don't really know. And then the last point I really like is on data. I think that's a great point. Uh, we, you know, I totally agree with you that we should not rely on data, but I think uh, what I try to do, right? I think also Professor Chen has been doing a lot of the, um, the economic historians have been doing is, uh, you know, we know that Chinese history is a gold mine, right? It's, there are a lot of, lot of really important information. We know that, uh, uh, all the social sciences um, are very biased uh, toward Europe. That is, you know, we know that it's very Eurocentric. So they have a lot of data on Europe, but they just start to scratch the surface on Chinese history. And then a lot of the work, you know, Professor Chen has been doing, you know, what I have been doing is really to show that we can uh, uh, do really interesting research using Chinese data, right? So I think, you know, uh, 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 no data is enough, I guess. And then I think more it's always merry, but I think the important thing is uh, we want to encourage people to take advantage of Chinese history and then to really use Chinese history to join the debates about those uh, big questions in social sciences because we have we are sitting on a gold mine, I think. I'll stop here. Yeah. So maybe just to follow on this very quickly, uh, I, I guess uh, uh, what uh, Professor Hu was referring to when he talked about uh, of quantifying uh, institutional state capacity. Uh, you, actually, you, you did cite uh, uh, work by you know, Derbin Ma and uh, Jared Rubin and others. So they use uh, the ability to raise taxes uh, uh, as a percentage of GDP as a, a metric, capturing the uh, state capacity uh, uh, or the lack thereof. And then uh, I guess um, economic growth and some other metrics can also be used. But let me uh, I take at least uh, uh, two or three uh, questions from the audience. Uh, so first uh, from uh, Jerry Dong, uh, uh, he says, um, you know, since you are using Madison data, it seems that uh, uh, Chinese or Qin dynasties share 
of world GDP was never as low as uh, one twentieth uh, uh, during the Qin Dynasty. Huh? So actually, at the peak uh, around uh, 1820, uh, uh, Qin China's share of the world GDP was about 32 uh, percent. Um, and then throughout the 1900s, uh, it was never below 10 percent. So, so this is something uh, you may want to uh, uh, check into um, just to make sure that uh, you know there is some consistency uh, between uh, your estimates and um, yeah, and, and what has been uh, in in the uh, literature. So let me uh, hold on. There, yeah, there are more more than forty uh, questions uh, from the audience. Um, so from Donald Wu, uh, how do you collect the data of the marriage and kinship networks of the aristocracy or ruling class? But I guess yeah. Already, so uh, yeah, yeah. So I think you know part of the, I just want to. Um, give credits to historians for a lot of this data because uh, you know, for the Tang data, for example, there's a historian at Berkeley, uh, Nicholas Tackett. Uh, he has written a book uh, about the Tang meritocratic families. And then he actually was the first one uh, to my knowledge to collect very systematically the data on marriages among those families. So I, you know, a lot of my data collection is built on their efforts and then I, I try to expand uh, the data collection so so I, I, I don't want to give, give the credits to the historians who have done the pioneering work okay so the next question uh, is from uh, Mark uh, uh, Westerby uh, if you were a member of a bow tie structure elite system living at the center you might think there were motivations to form links uh, such as by marriage or uh, of children uh, with the other half of the bow tie, and those links, uh, if there were if there were enough of them, would convert it into a star structure uh, from a bow tie structure. So, why do you think uh, this did not happen? Uh, so, so, to put it another way, uh, what do you think uh, drove uh, movements? Uh, from a bow tie structure to a star structure or vice versa. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I think the, the key here is still the institutions, right? The, the Kudju, I think, played a really important role, you know, the civil service examination system. I think what happened, you know, I, I didn't talk about this, but I talk about this in the book more is uh, after the Kudju was introduced, the local families knew is very uncertain whether their son or their grandson can become a bureaucrat because of the competitiveness of the code, right? It's like the Gaokao, right? And then you might succeed one generation, but you're, you cannot guarantee you can succeed um, multiple generations. And then I think for those families, the best strategy is not to say, you know, I want to build a star network with central officials because my next generation may not succeed in the Kudju. So they might stay in this county forever, right? And then that's the same for the, the third generation. So the best strategy for me facing the uncertainties is to build my power base in this locality. That's where my, you know, my, my, my income is coming from. That's where my powers come from, right? So the best strategy is to focus on the locality, their local ties, their local connections with the hope that maybe, you know, three generations from now, there will be another one, you know, will succeed in the culture. So I think once culture became uh, um, institutionalized after the Song, uh, the family is really difficult for the family to build a star network because of the uncertainties. So the next uh, question uh, is from Xi uh, Yu uh, Mao. How would you describe today's China? A star, a star structure or a bow tie structure? I guess I can also say that maybe, uh, do you think, um, there has been a transition uh, from a star structure to a bow tie structure over the last 10 years. Okay. <laughs> well, um, let me just say that, you know, this will get me into trouble, but let me just say that um, I think there, you can see that there was some tendency, right? Um, at the beginning of the PRC and also maybe in the late 1970s, 1980s, uh, 
uh, you can think about some families, right, uh, that are centralizing, and then where you can you can you, you can probably know or see some connections between those families, right? Let's just now name those families. Let's say there are families who are connected with each other, and then those families played a very important role both in the early period of the PRC, but also in the early reform era, right? And then you know both in business, but also in politics, right? And then I think that um, uh, what happened in the last ten years, uh, I think you know what. One thing I realized that, you know, a lesson we learned from Chinese history, right, is um, uh, when emperors want to stay in power, you know, one thing they have to do is to weaken the elites, right? And I think that, um, uh, now just stop there. <laughs> I don't want to continue. Uh, okay, anymore. thank you. Thank you. Let me uh, take the last uh, question. I think one last question uh, from uh, the audience. This is from uh, uh, Arstead uh, Arberg. How come a strong state and a weak sovereign uh, went hand in hand uh, in imperial China, where uh, while many countries in Europe managed to combine absolute monarchy with a strong bureaucratic state, why could European monarchs build strong nation states and at the same time uh, curb the nobility while uh, Chinese emperors could not? That's a great question. That's actually the topic of another uh, uh, book or you know, idea I'm working on. So, um, uh, in the in my current book, I, I, I briefly talk about this. I think in Europe, the the key there is they have so-called representative institutions, the parliaments, and then once you have representative institutions, it can do two things. One is it can um, uh, build this credible commitment, right? You know, from the ruler to the elites that uh, once the ruler collect taxation, they will use the taxation for building state capacity, right? And that's what happened, for example, according to Norris and Weingast during the Glorious Revolution, right? And then so the representative institutions um, enable the European rulers to build a strong state. Um, and then also at the same time, uh, stay in power for very, very long because uh, the elites know that they don't have to kill the king, right? Because they can bargain with the king in the parliament. So they don't have to kill the king. And then therefore you can see longer ruler duration in Europe, but also at the same time, stronger state capacity, right? And then, and then you might ask why China didn't have representative institutions, right? That's a good question. I think the answer that I arrived at, uh, this is um, based on joint work with Mark Dinchenko at Michigan, is we argue the political geography is very different in China and Europe. So in China, most of the time, China was unified. Therefore, the elites have no exit option, right? They they, they want to bargain with the emperors. And then when the emperors don't want to bargain, the, the elites cannot say no, they cannot leave the country because the country is so, so big. In Europe, they can just leave. For example, all the, um, the English nobility, they can just go to France, right? It's, it's very nearby. But in China, because of the political geography, there's no exit option of the Chinese elites for a long time. Therefore, they don't have much bargaining power with the Chinese emperor. So they cannot ask for a representative institution. Okay, let me take uh, one last uh, uh, question. Uh, this is from uh, Wang Suqi. Uh, perhaps this network model it's just a visualization of the well-known centralization uh, versus decentralization uh, uh, framework, uh, uh, authoritarian versus uh, feudal system. So that's um, a question. Yeah, I think I wouldn't call China a feudal system, even you know the the under the Bowtie Network is not a feudal system, right? That's the the old um, Marxist definition of Chinese. Chinese history, you know, Guomo Ruo, for example, define imperial China as a feudal society, which you know we all have rejected now. We we know that China was not a feudal society. A feudal society means there, you know, the feudal local feudal lord in Europe, for example, the feudal lords would have power of taxation of of military mobilization, and then they have, you know, they and then there's an exchange between the ruler and then the feudal lords. When the ruler were fighting wars, the feudal lords have to contribute, but then. Um, uh, in exchange, the ruler will give the feudal lords land. That was not the case in imperial China. Maybe that was the case, you know, before the Qin Dynasty, you know, during the Warring States era, you know, in the Zhou Dynasty. But after the Qin unified China and started to appoint people to the county level, China was no longer a feudal society. So, but, but I agree with I think I, I agree with the larger point that um, 
uh, that there might be some correlation between the structure of the social relations and the structure of the formal formal bureaucracy. That is, uh, under bow tie network, you might think that is a more decentralized system. That that's actually true. That is, uh, uh, but but it's not really about decentralized to the local government. It's really about decentralizing to the local families. That is, starting in the Song Dynasty, we start to see. The, the, the state, the imperial state started to delegate some of the functions, for example, local governance, you know, public goods provision, uh, repairing tax, you know, to the local families. So you can argue that that is kind of a decentralizing structure, but it's now the, you know, in the traditional way where they, you know, it's about decentralization from the central government to the local government. It's really about from the state to the society. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I, I, I have to apologize to, uh, uh, many uh, friends and uh, colleagues uh, who have posted a very, very good questions. Uh, uh, you know, now 46 of them, I, I, we're already uh, five minutes behind schedule. So I, I cannot uh, take any more questions. Uh, so I, uh, but uh, we're, go uh, we're gonna send all the questions to, to uh, Professor yeah. Wong so that uh, really we can uh, see uh, where he can address uh, your, your questions uh, in uh, his uh, revision huh, to the book. Uh, so again, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Wan, and also uh, our thanks uh, to uh, all the uh, attendees uh, in this uh, particular webinar as well as uh, uh, in other webinars. So thank you very much. And then just very quickly, uh, we have recently redesigned the main website for the Quantitative History Society uh, and also set up uh, our own uh, YouTube channel uh, related to uh, quantitative history, uh, uh, you know, w uh, programs and recent efforts. So uh, please, uh, you know, scan the barcode in order to get to the, uh, the uh, society's uh, website and then uh, keep uh, up to keep yourself uh, you know, up to date with uh, recent happenings and uh, scheduled events and so on. Okay, so this is it uh, for today's uh, 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 webinar. So again, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Wang. Thank you, Professor Chen. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you everyone for attending. Yeah, see you, bye-bye. Okay, bye now. Yeah.